What I think、uh, people misconstrue about developers or just programming in general is that it's an analytical and not a creative field. But anyone who's worked in in programming knows that it is like it. There is an analytical aspect to it, but it is an incredibly creative、uh, space, and that without that creativity, you're not actually going to get anything done. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. Today we're chatting to Herman Martinez. So I came across、uh, Herman speaking to my soon-to-be sister-in-law, who studied with him, and、um, I was quite interested in his story and particularly why is Herman is traditionally a developer, and Alfie and I were chatting a bit about、uh, getting developers on the podcast. Essentially, because as as traditional designers or creatives, we always have the stigma around developers not being as creative as we are, and I'm sure a lot of you also carry that same perception. And、uh, I mean, it comes from a certain space and place. But Herman is a co-founder of a web app called Just Sketch Me. And I encourage you to look、uh, look it up while we're busy speaking because it's quite phenomenal. And it's a posing tool where you can basically take a three D doll, whether it's a human or a figurine or a fantasy character, and model its joints and body in a way that you want to, as you would in real life with those little wooden dolls, to essentially help you as a digital artist when making these environments or pieces of work, and I found this really intriguing because it's such a beautiful combination of using development and that set of tools to create something that's essentially a core part or core tool for a conventional artist. Mm. And、um, let me let me maybe pause there and just say, <laughs> Herman, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for having me on here.、Uh, I think that the first, I, I don't know if this is controversial, but I'm just going to argue with you straight off the bat. Is、uh, <laughs> with、uh, I, I think that that the concept of creativity is is a fascinating one, and it's it's something that I'm I'm really interested in because I do actually see.、Uh, Programming as a creative tool. However, I wouldn't necessarily,、mm-hmm. you know, quote unquote, identify as a developer. I actually have a have a background in creating video games, and I think that、wow. video games are like the、uh, like a very、uh, they're they're like a crossroads of many many different creative、mm. intersections. You've got your、mm. sound design, you've got your visual design. More importantly, you've got. You've got storytelling, but you've also got something that is completely unique to games, and that is、uh, a, a like immersion. It's it's the design of how people interact within the system, right?、Mm. And so you kind of create your own story within within the game space, and so these these facets that make video games such a creative field to be involved in. I've just kind of transferred into my own、uh, my own journey, building my own、uh, apps and games and websites、mm-hmm. and stuff like that.、Um, however, it, coming back to the original thing about like what what defines creativity is it, if we if we try and pin down an actual definition, it becomes really. Really hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, so hard. <laughs> yeah, it's like,、uh, is it is it the ability to come up with the most original, disjointed ideas? Like, if I say to you,、uh, mm. you know, come up with a completely novel thing right now, the、mm. first thing you do、mm. is you look at the stuff that's on your desk and you're like, lamp,、mm-hmm. you know, tree.、Mm-hmm. Um, 
but uh, one of the most uh, widely acknowledged forms of creativity is the ability to, to create completely novel ideas or completely mm. disjointed, uh, not disjointed, but separate ideas um, mm. Mm. In, a, in a short period of time. What I think uh, people misconstrue about developers or just programming in general is that it's an analytical and not a creative field. But mm -hmm. anyone who's worked in, in programming knows that it is like it there is an analytical aspect to it but it is an incredibly mm. creative uh space and that without that creativity you're not actually going to get anything done um it turns out that the entirety of the internet is just held together with the spit prayers and uh, a little bit of like <laughs> sellotape yeah and i mean the the most complex systems are like that like i mean snowden's story is a great example of that um and you know i think what you what you mentioned is a very very good point and i think especially because my in some sense my background started off as a developer and um, mm -hmm. while i was studying i was going to eventually become a developer and i think that that's one of the first times that i started to really realize the creative aspects of development and i think one of the one of the reasons why uh, software engineering as a whole um is not necessarily conceived as a creative discipline is that the barrier to entry isn't creative when you think about art, when you think about music, when you think about all of these kinds of things, the learning process is creative. But it's almost like with um, software engineering, it's sort of like you have to do the analytical, technical side of stuff to get to the creative side. But then when you get to the creative side, it's so interesting because it's like there's so much possibility because the medium is so blank. It's like you, your code can do anything. Mm. Mm. So, so that's a that's an interesting point that you bring up, and it's uh, something that I'm currently writing about. Uh, mm. Is the way that we teach software development at the moment is terrible, right? Like, mm. uh, it, people who come out of university aren't necessarily good developers, um, and that's because of the nature of software development. It's more akin to a craft like carpentry than mm -hmm. it is to, say, accounting. And mm -hmm. the analogy that I like to use is that if you want to teach someone to be a carpenter, you don't put them in a lecture hall and tell them about the different tools that you have access mm -hmm. to and the different grains of wood. Instead, mm -hmm. what you do is you take them into a workshop and you get them shipping away at, at bits and pieces um, mm. in order for them to better understand these fundamentals. Later, sure, you can you can put them into a lecture hall once they've grasped the underlying concepts, but mm. until then it doesn't really make sense. And and so what I've uh, what I've found the best advice that I can give people who are trying to learn software development is choose a project, a small project, and then do it. Right? Mm -hmm. The process of you trying to figure out how to do it will teach mm. you more than all of the tutorials, mm. uh, et cetera, mm. et cetera. And that's, that's based on a, on a concept uh, of like cognitive models of learning or, or modalities mm. of learning, where the way that we learn isn't through following a tutorial, right? Because what you're yeah. doing is you're, you're, you're creating, you're um, just doing what, is, what you're being, being asked totally. to do. Whereas the yeah. way that you learn something is by experimenting, by failing, by, you know, trying to figure out how to do this. And so the, like an artist doesn't come out of a mm. art degree at a university fully formed in the same way that a developer doesn't come out of university fully formed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, what the pivotal point was when I started thinking, actually, you know, for me, my perception of uh, the developers I've worked with or just general programming in general has a bit more a creative element than I initially thought was it's, ex it's exactly what you just said, that learning happens when we kind of push into a corner, right? It's like a, an animal in the wild when you're in a corner and you kind of now have to problem solve and figure out how the hell am I going to get out of this corner to survive? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, like myself included, think that programming is very black and white because it uses, you know, things that are very concrete. Like when you programming, you're using your keyboard. It's very defined. It's a definite digit that you're putting in. So it can be seem very black and white. So cool. 
you need to program something very simple. Let's say the navigation bar and a header of a website. And there's one way to do it. It's black and white, yes or no. Mm -hmm. And when I started working closely with developers, I very soon realized that that's not the case, that there are Mm -hmm. so many different ways to do that. And depending on the constraints and Mm -hmm. the, the bigger problems in the holistic picture, will help that's the corner that that's kind of created for you right then you kind of have to figure out what's the best way to get out of that corner and that's kind of where i saw uh the Mm. developers i was working with becoming very creative because they were asking me all all kinds of questions like should it be this or that do you have this and like but what do you mean like why do you need all these answers from (laughs) me i thought it's just like you just there's just one way to do it. I did, I, mm-hmm. I thought it was a more linear process mm-hmm. than it is. So and I want to that bring that up because I, and, and I, I know a lot more people think that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I will, so, so I think that what needs to be appreciated um, about the space in general is that, firstly, when you're working as a developer, you can work in pretty much any field. Are you interested in music? Mm-hmm. You can work in music. Are you interested in uh, movies? You can work in movies. Are you interested mm-hmm. in et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But so I think behind me, I have a conveniently placed, uh, there's a, yeah, a guitar and a, a guitar and a piano, <laughs> right? Now, now we, we know that guitars or pianos are actually a better example of this. We know that when you press a button on a piano, a certain thing happens. It makes mm. a certain tone, right? When you press them in conjunction with other keys in the piano, it, it strikes a chord. Uh, and you can press it hard, you can press it soft. You have the foot pedal in as well so that it you know, creates a, a less stilted note, right? And so the, we, we don't ever question the creative space of a piano. We're mm. like, people can be incredibly creative with the piano. Now, mm. with a computer, it's the same concept, except for the fact that the creative space is so much more, right? Yeah. You mm. can use a piano and you can make piano music, whereas you mm-hmm. can use a computer and you can make anything. Mm-hmm. I'm loving this analogy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is, you're right, it is very true. And in some ways, I think sure. that's really the challenge around teaching um, software engineering. It's like, I mean, when you need, if you, if you, if you want a person to learn, um, taking, taking the sort of creative route to learn piano, it's pretty clear where you need to start. You need to sit in front of a piano and figure out what the keys do. But it's sort of like in software engineering, there are so many different, like there's the different languages, the different libraries, the different sort of parts that you're engaging in, be it front end, back end, um, and everything in between. And then over and above that, there's also the context of the, how you're applying your project. And it's like there's different constraints depending on what industry that you're in. And then there's the industry, like the domain specific knowledge that you have to pull into things. So it's like, in a sense, you almost have to create such a large system to replicate what it would be like to really um, um, perform as a professional in that space. And I think that's one of the things that's really challenging about teaching development, because you have to create, in some ways, a relatively realistic mm. system to get the full experience of, of learning. Yeah, It's true. It's true. And it, it does also... So development has never been more accessible for a person starting out, but also less accessible to the, I don't know, quote unquote, higher echelons of, of engineering is that uh, you, can, you can get a job at a bank right out of university with your computer engineering degree, and you can mm-hmm. stay there for 25 years and you know, get a good salary and get out of there in the end, but without actually accumulating that much knowledge, or you yeah. can go the route of, you know, changing companies every two or three years, working on your own business, doing side projects and kind of like tasting different industries. Mm. Um, and I think I'm not telling anyone to quit their job, but it is, uh, <laughs> it is definitely it. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it's definitely interesting, uh, seeing the whole spectrum of, um, things that are available to you. So for, mm. As an example, uh, if I take a look at my my career history, 
I started out working at a company that built online stores, right? And mm. so I actually worked on Cape Union Mart's online store, uh, wow. Photocom's online store. And so I, I gained a bit of knowledge around like how e-commerce works in general. And at the time, I tried to start my own e-commerce company that sold computer parts uh, that failed miserably because it turns out that mm. the margins are really low and it's real cutthroat. But, Hectic, um, yeah. but then I uh, went on to work as a video game developer. And even just in that context, I worked on a virtual reality training simulator to teach wow. commercial pilots how to fly a very specific aircraft, an Embraer of sorts. It's been a while. Um, but mm. in this case, it wasn't necessarily a flight simulator. It was more a space for them to do like emergency procedures and stuff in uh, VR. Mm. So it's like, oh, the fire alarm is on. Okay, I need to, you know, make sure that this hatch is sealed and press this button and radio the, t the nearest mm. tower, etc., etc., etc. And so I got a lot of uh, uh, insight into the training in the in the um, commercial pilot industry and I actually ended up going to uh, Brazil when the project was uh, acquired by one of the airlines there um, wow. I then worked as a subcontractor for Disney for a bit making like silly little mobile games uh, mm. like Ulsa's Ice Castles and you know um, <laughs> yeah. cool. and uh, then I uh, went and I did the whole remote thing for a tech company this was before remote working was the norm um, that was essentially Airbnb but for boats so if you wanted to get a canoe mm. or a yacht or a speedboat pretty much anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Um, you could do it through the platform and similarly you could rent out your boat when you're in these things. So I, I now know a bit more about <laughs> two things, um, boats <laughs> and also uh, a, sort of like asymmetric marketplaces. So mm. um, your Airbnbs and whatnot. Mm. Um, and I went and I got my, my sailing, my uh, competent crewman, uh, I don't want to say it's a license, but I am now a competent crewman. Certification. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I started running my own projects. Um, I've uh, one in the art space and one in the writing and privacy space. And mm. so it's, it's safe to say that I've had like a good diversity of experiences mm -hmm. um, where, and, and a very, and I think that Another, yeah, just circling back to what we were talking about with creativity is another um, definition of creativity is the ability to, to have uh, novel ideas, which are the combination of separate ideas. And the way that you have, uh, you, you have that is by having knowledge of various fields. And so the most mm -hmm. creative ideas are the ones where someone happens to work uh, as a medical doctor, but also mm -hmm. as an astrophysicist, and then realizes that, you know, the way that planets move is similar to, I don't know, how bad mitochondria dates. does things, bad <laughs> dates, whatever, um, and, and makes that connection. Sure, and that's a real thing. This <laughs> creativity. So I, mm -hmm. I encourage people, I encourage people to uh, experiment in their careers. It also makes and that's, it interesting. That's one of one of the reasons why I'm like more and more um, from my side because I think in some ways I've got although I've been a designer I've got a, a very diverse interest and I tend to do a lot of things on the side that have nothing to do with the design. <laughs> um, and because of that, in a sense, it makes you. I wouldn't even say a more valuable. It, it, it's not even that it makes you a better designer. It's sort of like your, your your pool of resources that you draw ideas from becomes wider. And so it seems like you're more creative, but it's only because the the set of ideas that you have, um, the, the, the set of ideas that you draw from for new ideas is more broad. Um, and, and so like more and more, I'm, I'm starting to both appreciate people who come from outside the field. Um, and in a sense, sort of make make their way and and kind of like self teach, um, and then also appreciating people who do design and then do something else that's completely random. Because I find they always they, they challenge my way of thinking the most. Uh, so I was actually having a chat with my girlfriend a while back, and 
I have a very difficult time when someone asks me what is it that I do um, mm. because it's really easy to say like oh I'm a developer uh, but that that is probably probably the one of the fewer things uh, things that I do is like I I would say I'm a product designer right I I build things that people use um, but what I think makes a good designer and I assume that you have lots and lots of designers who listen to, to your podcast considering it's kind of in that space <laughs> um, is that it's empathy it's understanding the way that people interact with the world and trying to build things that have like ingrained affordability uh, the way that mm -hmm. people understand the world works as well as uh, just this inherent like uh, beautification of the the process we all like to use things that are nice to use as opposed mm -hmm. to things that are not nice to use and so uh, when I when I build things, it's very much not you know Photoshop. Photoshop is a perfect example of this. Photoshop is shit, right? <laughs> it's an it, it, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah. But if you open up Photoshop, it's just got like buttons everywhere and mm -hmm. hieroglyphs and uh, mm -hmm. I yeah. But then uh, a great example of something that does this well is procreate it's like if you're doing digital art you open up procreate and there's like five or six visible tools on the screen and they all make intuitive sense right mm -hmm. or or at least they're very they, they have a very high discoverability so you pull mm -hmm. out your apple pencil and you like move this up and down it's like oh that's the opacity of the brush oh that's the size of the brush that's the color and that's a different brush type and there's mm -hmm. an eraser and the fact of the matter is that there are other tools that you can use, mm -hmm. but the person who is being introduced to those tools doesn't need them all up front. They need to have yeah. like, they have to find a need for it and then go mm -hmm. and yeah. find it. And I, yeah. I think that's one of the big philosophies in, in design for my own tools is that they, they have depth but simplicity so it's like a very simple mm -hmm. set of tools that are very easy to grasp but then mm -hmm. once you've you've grasped those tools you realize that they interact with each other in in nuanced ways that creates a lot more depth right mm -hmm. yeah. and uh so that's what i like to think about when it comes to designing things is how are people going to act when they are confronted with this and also like uh, you know I'm going to say something that is very like dissonant. It's like, don't treat your users like idiots and also treat your users like idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit. <laughs> so, Maybe for people who don't quite trust. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you, uh, and I'm sure you've, experienced this many times with tools that you've mm -hmm. used you open it up and there's a little tutorial that pops up that tells you something that's incredibly obvious right mm -hmm. um and it's it's obvious to you and it's also obvious to everyone else right mm -hmm. um or it will have a tooltip that pops up over here and it says hey this is the thing that does the thing and you're like i know it does the thing this is <laughs> how software does it's mm -hmm. like it's like imagine uh, and this is just a a um uh, exaggerated example, but imagine you opened up an application and then a tooltip said like, hey, the uh, the red X on the top right of the screen, or the top left of the screen, <laughs> that is used to close the application, right? Um, would be yeah. an example of like treating your users as idiots, and I'm exaggerating over there, but you kind of get the mm. point. On the flip side, though, is that uh, people are easily confused and so it is important to build affordability uh and I, I keep on using the word affordability and i realize that it's like a very much a design term in the same way that like mm -hmm. a I, I think the the uh best example is like a door that has a handle affords being pulled um mm -hmm. and a plate affords being pushed is the textbook version of that <laughs> um yeah but the the same thing can be said to to building products or designing uh, interfaces, et cetera, et cetera, is, is this idea that 
people are easily confused. So build things in a way that they are expecting them to be built um, or it has easy discoverability. So as a good example, I, was, uh, I went and I picked up my mom from the airport yesterday and I've got a new car. Mm. And my car, it, I, I go to wind down the window and I can't find the, the window winder button on the door. And the window winder button is on the center console. By the radio, yeah. Yeah, by the yes. radio. And and I'm like, I, I don't know how much I'm I allowed to swear on this channel. So. Is it a Mini Cooper? <laughs> it, it wasn't all a Mini, the Mini Cooper. Coopers do that? <laughs> it's a it's a Suzuki, um, but but it's wow. it's uh, it's like a terror. It's a it's a perfect it's a perfect example of something that wasn't broken. And mm -hmm. so, like, when you think about affordability with cars, is we know that historically until now, every car that you've used has either had a window winder, uh, the physical window winder, or the button where mm. the window winder was, mm. in conjunction with the fact that it is beneath the window that you want yes. to unwind. So putting it yeah. on the other side of you is like, it makes zero intuitive sense. Um, it's like walking similar. away from the door you want to open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> similarly the the new cadillac i saw someone ranting about this on twitter is another case of like terrible design that didn't have any thought put into it but people are like maybe this is cool um so the guy reaches for the glove box and there's no handle on the glove box so he's like do you press it like those counters in fancy kitchens where mm. you like press it and then the d didn't open didn't open no it turns out that you have to use the little touchscreen display and then you have to go to uh, like doors and you press that and then what? you have to press the yep. and, and the thing with that is like no one was sitting there thinking you know what I hate doing is opening the glove box on the glove box <laughs> yeah, criminals are gonna hate that invention <laughs> <laughs> bad yeah. user experience for criminals <laughs> don't buy exactly. that car <laughs> And, and so the world is littered with terrible user experience. And I think it's like yeah. our sacred duty as, as designers to try and make the world slightly better, or at least slightly less frustrating for people. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. That's so true. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, as you're kind of like speaking about your, your design philosophy, I've sort of got just sketch me open on the, on the side here. And I actually started to see that because I think... Um, you know, with your analogy about Photoshop, it almost to me feels like Photoshop was a tool created for photographers, like for a specialist, a person that, yeah. that kind of like has their tools that other people don't know about. And they go to like these like dark places where they've got conversations about lighting and, and, and all kinds of photography related things. Um, and in some ways, everything starts there. It starts with serving a niche and it's very specialized for that niche. And as it gets more famous, the scope of person that you need to be designing for changes and grows. And in a sense, then the product needs to become more general. And that's one of the reasons why I think some of the more uh, young, some of the younger tools are a lot more um, usable. And I think, you know, if you think about, for example, you know, the very controversial um, acquisition of um, Adobe and, and Figma. I think one of the things that Figma does really well that the rest of the uh, Adobe products don't do is it's much more intuitive. There's less tools on the screen. There's less things that you need to be confused about. It's just sort of like it gets you to the starting point a lot faster. Um, yeah. And, you know, if I if I now sort of look at um, just sketch me, right, one of the things that really stood out to me, because I've played with a couple of different tools that um, engage with 3D, like 3D in some kind of way. And a lot of them are really complicated. I remember when you I first started no using idea. Maya, I was yeah. just like, OK, yeah. can someone just tell me where to start? Video <laughs> tutorial 53, still trying to figure out how to just make a shape appear in the, in the frame. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And it's, and it's, yes. that's one of the things with just sketch me is that mm. uh, actually two things. The first one is you can make a better 3d model than you can make on just sketch me using blender or Maya. Right. Mm. But you have to learn mm. it. Whereas I yeah. exactly. can reasonably pick up and use just sketch me. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the intent of it. But what you said about uh, scope creep and feature creep is I've gotten really good at saying no. Right? Uh, <laughs> it's it, it, so so the way that I the way that I think about it is that 
there was a video game built back in the 2000s uh, called Ico. And mm. the design philosophy behind Ico, which this team went on to uh, build Shadow of the Colossus, which was you know, a huge game at the time, uh, mm. is designed by subtraction. And the Ooh. idea behind it is kind of like, uh, what's that Japanese lady who tells you to get rid of all your clothes? Um, I don't know. Uh, she's like, if it doesn't bring you joy, you know, you, you throw it out. <laughs> Um, okay, anyhow, mm. so, so, the, <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that, uh, is that if something doesn't emphasize your core offering, mm. be very cautious about adding it, right? Mm. And so I'll, uh, with just sketch me, I'll give you an example of where I, I blundered is just sketch me is specifically for artists to pick up and create uh, 3D scenes that they use for sketch references. And this is very useful for like cartoonists or especially comic artists who will have the same mm -hmm. scene, but with different like slight variations of the camera and slight variations on the poses of the characters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but a, a lot of people started using it to create characters to populate um, architectural drawings. Right, mm. and so interesting. But not not that many people, but they would send me emails and they're like, "Hey, I would like to export my 3D models as uh, as 3D objects, as opposed to just uh, exporting them as as images." And so I, through uh, a pretty arduous process, went and created a uh, bunch of scripts that would take the 3D models and bake them and allow them to be exported and then imported into these these various programs. And it took me a good chunk of development time. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I went and I added an event to it just to see how much it was actually used. And it's only used by like five people. And it <laughs> took me, it took me like a significant amount of time to build it. And it also takes up space in a menu. Like if mm. someone clicks on that menu and it says over there, like export as DAE or export as OBJ, people look at that and they are, they they think to themselves, oh, there are things here that I do not understand, which I think is fairly dangerous, is you want people to be able mm -hmm. to look at something and be like, there are things over here that on a cursory glance, I could probably understand. Mm -hmm. And so, and now I can't remove that because I made it and people started paying me money, you know, these five people started paying me money for that. But mm. uh, circling back to the design, the design by subtraction philosophy of, of eco, is in this game they they built out uh, the idea is you, you uh, I guess it's a trope in video games but damsel in distress you go to mm -hmm. try and to try and save her uh, to save the princess and um, you could change your armor and your weapons and it was like a bit of an RPG and then they realized that like actually no the the core fundamental of this game is about the relationship between these two characters. And what we're doing is we're actually like removing people from the experience by making them like sit inside of menus and compare stats between weapons and making sure that they mm -hmm. find this and that. So they kept on removing things from the design from the design of the game to the extent that in the game, there isn't even the concept of, of like health, like a health bar or death or anything like that. You don't, you can't even change weapons or your loadout. You just have a stick and these little beasties come and try and steal the princess away. And you have to like whack them off with your stick. And mm. it actually creates an incredibly beautiful and fairly successful game because it like emphasizes this core, this core concept. I, I'm mm. not sure who, who said it, but it's like, Perfection is not when nothing can be added, but when nothing can be removed. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I no, that. I I definitely yeah. have to agree with that. Um, and I almost wanna wanna just give um <clears throat> a quick view of of what Just Sketch Me looks like from from like um the initial encounter with it. So I'm just going to share my screen for a couple of seconds, just to talk about a few things that, that really stuck out to me. Um, so 
you know, this is this is kind of like once you open the web app, this is what you're presented with. And one of the things that I really like is like this to me almost feels like I'm looking at a, a almost like my desk at school when I'm starting the day. It's like there were a couple of things on the side that I'm going to need later in the day. But for now, I've just got this blank canvas and I've got like the center of my focus in the middle. And I mean, some of the ideas that you're speaking about here, just by how it's laid out, like there's what I think there's one word on this entire screen. <laughs> <laughs> like that's not a very common thing. And it, it, it's the, the, the idea that you mentioned of like, you know, taking it as far as you can until you can't remove anything else. And I think, you know, also taking into account what the, what the, the, the word that actually exists represents in the larger scheme of things. Um, in a sense, it, 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 almost puts a specific emphasis on what a word represents in the context of a screen like this. Um, and I think also as a designer, that's something that I can really appreciate. I think the other thing that was, that was super cool was this little circle. You know, you've got like a whole white blank canvas and then there's a random dot. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> that was the first thing. You would think that the first thing I look at, I would look at is this model. But the first thing that stood out to me was this little dot. And I was like, okay, what happens if I click on it? And this is one of the most important things when dealing about uh, with 3D objects, being able to actually perceive the 3D environment on a 2D screen. And so like, th th there are a few subtle things that as a user you almost don't think about but when you analyze it from the perspective of a designer or a person who is just considering product and user experience that are you can see are intentional um and then there was also this little guy at the, at, at the corner also i mean i'm dyslexic so anyone who folk, like doesn't require reading of me you're already <laughs> in my good books <laughs> um, and I'm, there was, there was, there was a, lot, a lot that really stood out uh, another nice thing about um, about only having the word upgrade on the screen is that I recently went and localized the uh, the both website and web, web app to Portuguese, Spanish, and Japanese, uh, and the, the web app actually doesn't have that much that much text in it. Um, but what's what I uh, what I wanted to do over here is mm. I wanted to make two things apparent. Uh, first off, right? Okay, technically mm. three things, but one of them was about people giving me money. Um, mm -hmm. Is and and you can immediately see what they are based on the color, right? Is that you've got the tab on the left side and that's highlighted, mm -hmm. and you know immediately that that is the model in the center because it's got mm -hmm. the little color block next to it. It's got an image of that character and mm -hmm. it's got a couple of things that you can do. And these are, these are things that we understandably use. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have, have tooltips if absolutely necessary. And then the mm -hmm. second one is uh, the four tools on the bottom because those are the fundamental tools that the user uses and they are also mm -hmm. when you come in highlighted in uh the i think when you start it's it's orange on the uh, mm. leftmost yeah. tool ah. and so those are the only things that you need to start right they're the only things mm -hmm. that you need to start posing this one character Mm. Then you might get to a point where you're like, I want to add another character. So you look around the screen and there, I guess, so if you, the, the first one that'll catch your eye, especially considering we pan from left to right, top to bottom, will mm -hmm. be the two human <laughs> uh, thing, right? And, yeah. you know, if you, if you click that and drop it down, there's a bunch of characters to choose from. Um, I see you've been tabbing through them. Um, but then the the third one that I that I used color to emphasize was the upgrade button because <laughs> you know um, but so essentially what I what I wanted to do is I wanted to make it as accessible as possible now mm -hmm. if you'll if you'll uh, humor me for a second can you just press the yes. little question mark in the top right so when you first loaded the app this is the tutorial screen now mm. originally. I had built out an extremely complicated, like, you know those, you know those uh, systems where they like highlight this and it's like, okay, click this, mm -hmm. yeah, all like that adds a character to the screen. Now, mm -hmm. what I was saying earlier about how tutorials are actually pretty bad modalities for learning, it was, mm -hmm. uh, th this was a perfect example because people could just click through it and not actually learn how to use it. But mm -hmm. most people, I'll say like 95% of people just 
ignore it, right? <laughs> what's nice about what's nice about having a super simple tutorial like this is it mm. pops up. You immediately know what it is, right? Yeah, and you can skim it if it's your first one, but you don't. It's not necessary for you to complete it. You can just say "gotcha" and it disappears. But you also know that mm -hmm. you can bring it up at any time, just as like a quick yeah. cheat sheet. And I found that just having like a very quick cheat sheet that was very like available was mm -hmm. so much more useful than a significantly more complicated uh, tutorial mm -hmm. design. And that's the yeah. rationale around so that. Something that I'd, I'd actually add on to that that, that that struck me about this is um, because what the, the assumption that you make when you create a tutorial is that you know what the person should be learning. You, you're you assuming that what you're telling them are the things that they need to know to solve their problem. But something like this, in a sense, it's like, okay, I'm, I start, if, if I'm on, uh, it's good, gotcha. If I'm on the screen and there's something that I need to figure out, I know where the thing that I need to figure out is because there's really only one interface. And this shows you in a sense what each thing is. And so if I just want to know what this specific icon is, in a sense, it's showing me a representation of what I normally see with additional information overlaid over it. So there isn't like the the usual like tracking, like, okay, is this tooltip the thing that I'm trying to learn or this tutorial? Is it teaching me what I need to know? In a sense, it's just putting it all at face value in some sense. Um, yeah. And, I and think that, uh, to me is really cool. Thanks, I, I, I appreciate the compliment. Uh, but mm -hmm. also you'll notice it says, want to use just sketch me like a pro, check out our tutorial videos. And that's where yeah. I kind of talk about like um, depth, uh, depth comes later. So it's like once you figure mm -hmm. out these basic moves, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. uh, you can figure them out by yourself, but you can also go and once you have that context, it's like the carpenter who goes and then sits in the lecture hall to learn about different kinds of mm -hmm. wood grain, right? Mm -hmm. Is you, you now, once you have that context, can go and watch a video and be like, oh, okay, so if I add a prop to the scene, like a sword, and then I yeah. click the little this button and I click on the character's hand, it will move the sword into their hand. And now when you articulate the character, it will articulate with the sword um, mm. is is sort of more of a more of a pro move. And you can create yeah. like very big fancy dynamic scenes with this. And you can even import your own 3D models and stuff. But Mm -hmm. From the get-go, what I really want to do is, you know those little wooden um, mannequins that artists yes. use? Is I, I just want to make that. Yeah. <laughs> and if, yeah, you go into, if you go into characters on the top left yeah. and mm -hmm. you uh, click on other, uh, you can actually load the art mannequin in there. Oh, but, oh yeah. the art mannequin. Yeah. Oh, but that's you, amazing. <laughs> that's I should really make cool. that one free. Mm. And it's like, and, and that's, sorry, go for it, Steph. I just wanted to ask, you know, you just talk about the, the mannequin. I still want to figure out or actually just know from you how you guys got into this. So you're one of the co-founders, right? How does one, if you're in video gaming or where you were in your career at this point, where did this come from? Because this is also, uh, it's quite you know, unique in its space. Like you said, there are other 3D rendering tools, but this one specifically also focuses on not objects, but actual figures. And it also is a, like you mentioned, it's not something that requires a lot of um, professional expertise to figure out. Like where did this whole concept start? So as with, uh, as with stories like mm -hmm. this, you know, I, I, we can we can kind of make up little bits here and there, um, but in in a nutshell, uh, my good friend Simon, who I <clears throat> studied with at university, lived with for quite a while, and who I also worked with at the uh, game company that we were working at, uh, we were living together at the time, and we had one of those little wooden mannequins, and its leg <laughs> kept on falling off, and it was like pressed on. And mm. I, I'm not sure exactly what spurred it on, but we were chatting over over a cup of coffee, and it's like, why? This would be really easy to just digitize. You just get a 3D model, um, uh, one that has a working skeleton, and then you use the game engine's built-in uh, animation system to allow like the dragging of points. And so we 
built the first iteration of it using a using Unity game engine in no time at all because we were both intimately familiar with the system and it didn't have much functionality. It had a male and female character mm. uh, that you could pose, but you could only have one of them in the scene at a, at a time. Um, and we just like put it up on the internet and uh, mm. kind of left it there. We like went on Reddit for like, hey, we've made this thing. Mm. And we got some pretty nice feedback, but I didn't actually start paying that much attention to it until uh, I was mentoring some startups in Ghana um, for about three months. And I'm not sure if you know this about West Africa, but it's really hot. <laughs> and so I was, I was inside a lot of the time and I, I started looking at the, at the analytics of this and I saw there were like 200-ish people using it per day. And I thought like, you know, there are ways to make this a lot more useful. So the first one being is that it was a, it was a uh, Unity app, which doesn't play very well with, uh, with the web or with mobile phones unless it's exported specifically for them. So I went and I rebuilt it in a web first technology, in this case, uh, 3JS, which is just a convenient wrapper around WebGL. Mm. And then as it became more usable, more people started using it. I also went and I revamped the website and then I added mm. the ability to have like multiple characters in the scene. And during this time, I was also like talking with people who were using it and like getting feedback from, you know, artist communities. And so it was like a very organic growth over three ish, three ish years of just like feedback, build, mm -hmm. tell people no, uh, <laughs> and yeah, turn into turn into this. Um, when I say tell people no, it's like a lot of the time uh, people don't know what they want, and so mm -hmm. it is kind of your job as a designer to tell people what they want, because uh, they will say something along the lines of, um, "It would be really nice if these were animated so that you know we could get the full flow of this." And it's like, no, what do you what you actually want is you. Uh, you want the ability to, you know, save different poses and articulate it in the way that you are comfortable so that when you sketch it out, you can mm -hmm. have a uh, series of animated steps for your comic or your um, mm -hmm. whatever that you're building. Uh, if I had just said, oh, that makes sense and went and added animation, I would have added a useless feature or at least a feature mm -hmm. that someone thought that they wanted and then they're like, actually, this isn't exactly a thing that that works for me um yeah but yeah just sketch me is now i want to say four or five years old um wow. we have a full-time employee who collaborates with artists online and we nice. fund another art tool in the uh figure drawing space and um we work remotely i spent the last three months in Southeast Asia. Um, mm. And That's yeah, crazy. now I'm back in Cape Town and uh, here for summer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and so off the back of that, like maybe, um, and I don't know how much of this you've, you've had time to think about, like in, in relation to just sketch me or in a sense, the work that you're doing in general, like is there, is there an end game for something like this? Is there somewhere that you're hoping for it to go? Like, what's when you think about just sketch me and the future together? Where does your mind go? Well, so there's uh, it is something that I have thought about, and there's three ways that this that this goes, um, each with their pros and cons. Um, the first one is that I just carry on doing what I'm doing. Uh, I maintain it. I refine the system. Maybe I build out a few new features. Nothing major, and. Mm. An incumbent, uh, sorry, a newcomer to the market might make something significantly better than me. Let's take, for instance, someone comes in with a whole bunch of VC capital. They might not make a more sustainable business than me, but they could theoretically create a much better tool and mm -hmm. offer it completely for free, right? Mm -hmm. That would toss me out of the market and people would yeah. be using that instead, of, style. instead of just sketch me. Um, also, like Silicon Valley, they they dump huge amounts of investment money on, on people like, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere between four and 40 million for a seed round, $40 million. 
right? Um, <laughs> uh, but it's also like fine for me to do that. I enjoy it. Mm. I, you know, I, I can fund my lifestyle quite quite easily on it. Um, the second one would be, and this is how most VC company uh, VC back companies go, or like uh, uh, companies that where after it's grown to a certain point, what you do is you sell it. You sell it off yeah. and you walk away with a fat stack and hopefully they don't destroy your baby. And this is less appealing to me because, you know, <laughs> I don't know what most of the time they destroy maybe your baby. Selling, I know, yeah, they most of the selling time. NFTs and I'm like, uh. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that is an option. And, you know, like if, uh, if someone comes along and offers me a silly amount of money for just sketch me, I'll be like hard pressed to say no. Um, mm. Or the uh, the third option is I could build it out and pivot it into you know different different fields. Uh, I have mm-hmm. physiotherapists who use just sketch me as a way to illustrate to their patients how to sit properly or how to do their exercises or wow. uh, this. I have a ski coach who uses it to illustrate to his uh, to his students how to like wow. position their body in midair. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually also have a Brazilian guy who's teaching magic with it. Um, don't ask me how. He's he's doing his thing. Uh, <laughs> That's um, crazy. But there's there there is there is space for it to expand. However, mm. I I recently or not that recently, about a year ago, I wrote an article called my product is my garden. And so I, I actually run just sketch me as well as a publishing platform called bear blog. And mm. in both cases, they are minimal and delightful. And mm. they pay me, uh, you know, a, a reasonable, a reasonable salary, but they're by no means like I'm by no means, uh, high rolling. Um, but also I treat my work, in such a way that I don't want to resent it or dislike it. So Mm -hmm. I I liken it to like puttering in my garden, right? Mm -hmm. I go out there and I putter and I (laughs) sometimes go to the farmer's market and I talk with other garden enthusiasts and, you know, Mm -hmm. I, uh, and and I enjoy that process. Um, Mm -hmm. I have no interest in like running a full scale farm. I have no interest Mm -hmm. in, you know, just like really pushing the gas and getting a combine harvester and maybe I'm taking this analogy a bit too far, but, uh, I think you understand. Yeah. No, I completely get you. And, and I think maybe if, uh, if either myself or Alfie's, uh, employers were listening, they wouldn't necessarily like what we're saying, but I generally don't like to work very hard and I generally don't work very hard. For that exact reason, because I really enjoy what I do. And as soon as I start working too hard, then I'm probably going to ditch your company. And that's if (laughs) if you look at my career history and (laughs) you'll probably notice that uh, this uh, the, the longest job I've had was a year, I think, 11 months or a year. And that's probably the reason why, because I worked (laughs) way too hard. So I think I think there's there's a there's a distinction that I, that I'd like to make here, is I don't mind working hard, but I need mm. to be engaged, right? And I think yeah. it's like okay, it's this engagedness that's the important thing. Is mm. if I'm coming into the office and I'm feeling dejected and I've like trained my you know Alt Tab key to switch away from YouTube whenever <laughs> anyone of import walks past, um, then like I'm I'm not sticking around there for long. However, what I've what I really enjoy, what I really savor is just those mm. periods of time where I, where I have an idea and I just like get so into the zone and so engaged yeah. that, you know, mm. if I have to be like peeled away from whatever <laughs> I'm working on in, in the evenings. I love that. Um, mm. it, it's a, it's a fickle mistress, but, um, mm. you know, it, it, it is, it's cool. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that you know, it's a flow. It, it sort of it sort of brings me back to what you you had spoken about at the beginning of this conversation um regarding development being a a craft more than a uh you know academic s- subject in some ways <clears throat> because you know a lot of the 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 um the patterns that you see with with uh the more um classical 
uh, artists, the visual artists, the musicians, and so on, they sort of face the same kind of problems where they get so into the music or so into the 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 piece that you literally have to fight them to eat and to sleep and to 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 find rest. And that's one of the things that I really um that I really appreciate about software engineering. One thing that I do think is a little bit different in software engineering that's very cool is that software engineering has got a very, very strong giving open source culture that I don't mm. think exists in all of these other craft sort of spaces. Because typically, like in craft disciplines, your secrets in some sense are what set you apart. Sort of like yeah, these techniques yeah. are mine and this is how I'm better than the competition. And so I'm going to keep them within my circle. Maybe I'll bring on a couple of apprentices and I'll teach them what I know, but then they're not allowed to share my secrets. And then you get the software engineers who are just like, hey, internet, here is my thing. Everybody go and play with it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, interesting, interestingly enough, is uh, Bear is completely open source. So you can go and see the source nice. code. And, uh, wow, you know, nice. you can spin up an instance of it if you if you want but open source software is a whole other episode um, <laughs> yes yes no, that, that is true i think i, I was I just really tr- trying to point out the fact that it's it's one of the things that and maybe it's because it's built on such a, like a, a technology that scales so much that in some sense there are or maybe actually it's a a a product of that idea that it's so widespread and there's so much potential that you can't do everything alone and so sometimes to get to point you know x y and z you need other people to help you get through the rest of the alphabet and open source approaches are typically the like a lot faster and, and more effective way to get there yeah, we certainly yeah. wouldn't be where we were in the modern world without open source software. Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, Alfie, you're already kind of alluding to, you know, uh, what our last question is for Herman. And we, in our previous episode, we uh, we spoke to a product manager who is very interested in experience design as well. And he left a question for the next guest, not quite knowing what the next guest or who the next guest would be. So he wrote down a question and says, if you can impact the world in a positive way, what would it be or how would it be? So this is something that I've uh, I've thought about. (laughs) It's a good question. Um, So I think that we have, uh, I'm currently reading uh, Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now. And it's a book that pretty much talks about the fact that we are in the best time in history, despite our observations, our, our uh, predisposition towards pessimism. And that being said, is there are still problems that need to be solved. And the, the problems that the 21st century has to solve are pretty much uh, climate change and then bringing the the rest of the world up to a certain threshold of living, right? I mean, currently, even in the developing world, we have higher life expectancies than the quote-unquote developed world in the 1950s, right? Um, Yeah. But I think that the way that you can have the biggest impact in the world is actually really boring, it is, uh, it is the concept of effective altruism. And the idea of effective mm-hmm. altruism is you donate money to causes that have the largest effect. That doesn't necessarily mean that you feel the best, right? So uh, as an example, let's take, for instance, there are, uh, that there are a whole bunch of people in rural Kenya who don't get clean drinking water. You could go and buy yourself a uh, flight ticket fly to rural Kenya, go and join, uh, join a bunch of people who go and you dig wells. But that would actually be terribly, terribly inefficient, right? Wasteful, because yeah. for the amount of money that you spent on just the flight ticket, you could hire mm. a whole bunch of local Kenyans to go and A, get upskilled in well digging and B, go and dig those wells as mm. well as introducing that money into the economy. Yeah. And so, mm. as I said, it's a very, it's a very boring uh, thing and it doesn't Instagram well, but 
<laughs> Arguably, if you're in if you're in the developed world, and especially if you're in a high paying career, it is in your best interest to just donate money in the way that is the most impactful. And so, currently, mm-hmm. uh, just sketch me uh, donates one percent of its revenue. This is before tax, before mm-hmm. uh, before um, expenses, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to uh, organizations that are what we consider doing. Um, in this case, uh, environmental good, so mm-hmm. reforestation, wow. Wow. Um, marine protection, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's Amazing. very cool. I love that. And <laughs> and I think it's 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 so right because with with doing good, the temptation to also look good while doing good is so big. Like yeah. every time you want to donate, you're like secretly hoping, is there somebody taking a photo of me handing this, you know, food funny, parcel funny to thing, someone? The funny thing that you say this is like, I was actually hesitant to tell you that Just Sketch Me does that because this is the first time that I have publicly said that Just Sketch Me donates its revenue yeah. is like we've been, mm. we've been doing it for, for a decent chunk of time, but it's not a, it's not a marketing stunt. Published. If it was a marketing yeah. stunt, yeah. We'd, we'd post about it on Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> But no, it's 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 something that I, I care very deeply about, and I also see that yeah. as the most effective way that I can, you know, make the world a better place. And mm-hmm. again, super boring, but turns out that the way the world is improved in increments. Yeah, um, yeah, and sure. it's improved by people willing to do the boring things that have like have <laughs> a lot of fair. impact, because everyone else is doing the fun things that have impact. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, this has been a really exciting conversation. I think I've learned so much already. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm so keen to just talk more, but uh, time is money and time is valuable. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll hit you up again. But there are so many links I can give the audience and we will put them all in the show notes and in the announcements post. You all have them. But uh, if you do want to get in touch with uh, Herman personally, where can someone find you? So they can find me on my blog, which is herman.bearblog.dev. That's D-E-V. And uh, I think I've got an email link over there if you really want to get in touch. That's also where I do my writing and where you can find other links to other work that I do. Mm-hmm. Nice. I'm, I'm actually not on social media, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for listening. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you next week. And Herman, again, thanks so much for your time. This was really great. It was a goodie. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Have a good one, everyone. Till next time.